Well, um, let's see now. About the Gnostic tradition. Well, the usual thing is to call anything you didn't like Gnostic and brush it off, but you can't do that anymore because the Gnostics were quite orthodox a good deal of the time. Nobody knows what Gnostic means anyway. Uh, but the fact that the Gnostics attributed their teaching to the 40 days is actually a strong um, testimony in its favor. Because if there's anything the Gnostics didn't like, it was the resurrection. If there's anything they loathed, they were all agreed on, common to all Gnostic sects, was denying the resurrection of the flesh. Would they be the people to invent the 40-day return of the Lord in the flesh to go teaching? No, they used it because it was there. They had to use it because they claimed to have this knowledge. This was the situation. The oldest definition of the Gnosis we have, of Gnosticism, is, quote, the knowledge that the Lord secretly imparted to Peter, James, and John after the resurrection. Peter, James, and John gave it to other disciples, and they passed it on. This is what it was. So if these people came along, now this was lost. And in the second century, everybody claimed to have it. And they got huge followings because everybody was hungry for it. And in order to combat their claims, the church had to invent its own, the main church, as it's called, had to invent its own counter-gnosis. And to this day, Christian thought is largely impregnated with this old Gnosticism, with this old false Gnosticism. But they were merely faking it. They were merely claiming to have something they didn't have, but it was what people wanted. It's what they were looking for. This was the thing, this is what the Gnosis was. Namely, by very definition, it was the teaching of the 40 days. So if the Gnostics wanted to sell anything, of course they had to attribute it to the 40 days. But nobody liked the idea of 40 days. The, uh, I think uh, the most interesting thing now would be to turn from generalities to some of these specific doctrine documents here. I took the most important one home to study it and left it there. So we'll use some others. But they're good. It's all good uh, stuff here. Where did I put some more? Oh, down bottom. Yes, here's some of them. Where do you open them any time? This, well, here, we'll mention one that we discovered. Right? This first came out in 1903. This is one of the older discoveries, and it was edited by Rahmani. And this will show, it starts out, since then, it has been associated with very early writings, one of the three earliest of all known writings is this one, which is quoted quite a bit in here. By seeing who quotes whom, you can find who's older than what. And uh, this is why it's able to build this up. And we're finding that there's a community of thought here, that you can't just say these were just a lot of crackpots and so forth. This doctrine and these rituals definitely emerge from the main picture here. And it starts out, after our Lord, upon having risen from the dead, appeared to us and has been felt by Thomas and Matthew and John, and we had made ourselves certain by undoubtable signs that he was truly our master and that he had truly risen from the dead, then it came to pass that he blessed us and proceeded to instruct us. So here is a typical case, you see. This is the teaching of the Lord during the 40 days of the time he came back. Now, in this one, he starts out with a long and rather terrifying picture of the apostasy. This is the sort of thing nobody wanted to accept. Uh, it's the main theme here, and then he gets into... Uh, yes, he says here, the time of my dispensation, before I shall be glorified hereafter, you must know that other things must happen, and there must be signs preceding my annunciation. This is an important thing, too. When he describes the second coming, see, the Lord uh, can uh, come to earth more than once. Seventeen times he came after the resurrection. Uh, Mr. Walvoort has listed them recently, and not mentioning this 40-day uh, affair. And um, so they believed, unlike the Jews, that the Lord could come more than once, that he would come and manifest himself from time to time. And in a doctrine, a doctrine I didn't bring, it's, the one I left home, among other things, as well as the canon, 127 canons of the apostles, he speaks about a very puzzling thing. He says, there's this long period of darkness going to come, see? And um, how will it end, they say? Well, he says, it will end when I come with him who sent me. And they say, well, what do you mean? You First you say, you will come, and then you say, your father will come. What do you mean by that? He says, I've said what I have said. 
When I come, I will come with him who sent me. He was going to come to somebody, you see, with, at that time. Then he says, I will only appear to the faithful who look for me. There will be a small group, he says, and this is quite a common teaching. There will be a small group who are looking for me. Them I will organize, and they will spread the gospel into a very dark world amid great opposition. But this is necessary to prepare for the second coming when he comes in glory. But this primary coming is one of the peculiar things, and one of the things that's rendered it offensive. Guerrier, the editor of the, in, in the Orientalia, Patrologia Orientalia, is much upset by that. What is this strange doctrine of his father coming? Sometimes with him, sometimes his father comes. How is this? How can this be? Well, he says, well, don't worry. When my father comes, I'll come. Um, and this he's talking about here, terrible times, that there must be other things happen. Uh, there must be upon the earth famine and pestilence and confusion and troubles and insurrections of people against people. And then he says... Um, for all these things have been predestined unto the last generation of men, and these things must be fulfilled until an honorable and sacred and holy generation has been raised again. Then he talks about the way the world will go, how that the, the barbarians will rule the world and shed blood and rule with blood and terror for many, many years upon the earth. Then he talks about the return. Then he goes and talks about church organization here. This is the one of those that gets less attention today because of the new and sensational discoveries. This one, here's a good one that was just found quite recently. In fact, it hasn't been 54. is the first time it was published, and only in part here. Part of, it's part of the Jung Codex. Now, and this is what happens in the Jung Codex. Again, it is after the resurrection. It's supposed to have been a letter of James, but it's very old. And... Um, <clears throat> the Lord says to them um, he's going to give them knowledge of resurrection ascension here we sat around him and we asked him questions and after James had talked with the Lord we said what did the Lord tell you what have you heard from his mouth how did he say things were going to happen and we ask those who answer, and, and we answer to those who asked us. He taught us, and he gave us his right hand. This is very common in these doctrines. We, many references of this occur. He gives them what is known as the sign. It's usually just called the, the sign, the oath, the sigma, the semeon, it's called that. It was the giving of the right hand. And that's the sign. There was a, a mark in the sign, which is the mark of the cross, which he was to recognize. It wasn't a cross mark. It was actually what they tell us is a mark of the nail. This is another thing. You run into this sort of thing all the time. But here he gives them the right hand, which is a sign. And he promised us life. And he revealed to us the marvels that would happen hereafter. And when we heard them, we believed in the revelation he gave us, although we were filled with bitterness and fear that the things we saw must soon arrive. See all this. There was a blessing to happen, and yet this bitterness and fear. I see this man comment, commenting on it says here, uh, well, for example, here he asks, they say, Lord, are we going to have prophets hereafter? And the Lord says, no, prophecy will come to an end. And Puig and Quispel commenting on this says the response of Christ is a very surprising one. We don't expect that prophecy was coming to an end, but this is what the picture was to be. But he says here, this writing is altogether too full of contradictory sentiments. Sometimes the Lord gives them a happy promise and a blessing and everything is wonderful and the next he's giving them this gloomy picture he says why can't they make up their mind well we see it's not an inconsistent picture at all they are filled with bitterness the word bitterness is used here for the things which they see are about to to happen the word they actually use in Coptic is distress and this is regarded as the last and highest revelation given these things not known to the church later on he says uh, as for you apostles, the apostles say, well, what's going to happen to us? What is this test we have got to, to pass through? They say, you will be persecuted, but you will accomplish your end. You will accomplish the purpose that God wants for you. He will love you no matter what happens and will make you equal to me. And he will think that you have become his beloved, his dearly beloved, because you have made this decision, this proheresis, because the persecution which is about to come will be a proof. It is a test which God wants you to suffer and be accepted in good, for, in good faith. Therefore, he says, don't take death too seriously. 
May, he says, uh, be like those who, who seek for death, just as the dead seek for life, because only there can you get what you want to. What is it you're worried about, he says. You can expect this sort of thing. You cannot avoid your fate. You cannot avoid death, he says. The kingdom of God requires it of you. Be the elect. Accept this assignment. Gather together the children, my children, in the Holy Spirit. And this is the way he talks. And here he says about the two generations. Don't you know that prophecy tells them prophecy will come to an end with John? See? And John was the last one to survive. And then our writers say, well, this is a surprising and a depressing bit of news. This is a very recent discovery, and that's why we mention it here, but this is typical of what's going on. Well, um, another one here is the newly found Gospel of Philip. We have Thomas. That's a good one. Here's one. Let's, uh, this one was very elegantly got out. This is uh, the, Jung, the Jung Codex. It was bought and sent to the Jung Museum in Zurich, where it now reposes for a time. They promised to send it back to Egypt. It was discovered in 1952. It was published with great splendor in 1956 in this volume, where they get out the nice photographs of the text and uh, very elegant uh, uh, transcriptions and translations and everything else of this text. But it's been puzzling to everyone, and yet it shouldn't be so puzzling. It's called the Gospel of Truth and is usually taken as quite, quite a Gnostic piece because it's full of unfamiliar things. And yet... The things are familiar to us. For example, it starts by saying that Christ is to be completely rejected. He was rejected, and don't expect it'll be any better with you. Then, he uh, talks about the pre-existence in our life here and the necessity of returning to our Father in Heaven. It's interesting, in the, in the papal bull, a very recent one of Pius XII, the, uh, the bull called uh, um, Mediator Dei bull, he speaks of this life as an exile. Well, now, how could this life be an exile if this is the only world you've ever known? What are you exiled from? And exile is someone who's away from home and has to go back again, isn't it? Yet here we find the Pope today speaking of our life here as an exile. This, and it is actually the pressure of these documents that bring about these very, very basic changes in Christian ordinance and doctrine today. This is what this stuff in Rome is all about, trying to accommodate to this for a change after thousands of years of accommodating to the schools of philosophy. Now, uh, this return, and then he says, he talks about Jesus blessing and receiving the children here. This is a common thing here. And then the writing of names of books, and then he talks about the other worlds and the other spaces. He uses the words, uh, the other spaces. In whatsoever other spaces it might be. Jesus has appeared in them too, and why he came here and why he was nailed to the wood, and he fixed his covenants and his laws here and laid them down and here. Then, after that, he clothed himself with an incorruptible garment. This is always used. And having penetrated into the spaces of other worlds, he viewed the vain terrors of this world. And then he talks about the book of life, and again about returning to the Father, our return to heaven, returning to the Father. We are foreordained. And then this is very Egyptian, about calling upon the name. But the one thing this emphasizes more than anything else is the name of the Son. Here's some long sections on the pre-existence here. There our home is the heavenly home. Therefore, if we call upon him, he is our Father, he will attend, he will, he will listen, and he will answer. And he will turn to whoever calls upon him, however remote we may be from him, that we may return to his presence. This is the knowledge we must know. Know who you are. This is a theme that comes out all the time. The Gnostics emphasize this too, this know who you are in the perfect book. But then, return to our heavenly Father and our heavenly Mother. He has purified those that they might return to their Father, to their Mother, Jesus, from the infinity of his mercy. The Father discovered his nature to him. He taught it to us. And then the importance of unity. Unity is everything, always it, he says, it is this same unity which invests all the spaces, all the outer spaces are invested in this, in the same single system, in the same universe of discourse. Um, then, <clears throat> here's an expression that's used a lot by the apostolic fathers later on about the full, uh, Hermas uses it, the pastor of Hermas, about the full and empty jars. 
The trouble in the church are those who are half and half. The, the devil uh, can't occupy a full jar. He can't spoil what's in an empty jar. There's nothing there. The devil likes half full jars to deal with. People that are half there, you see, because there's when you can really corrupt. You have something to work on, and you have plenty of space to operate in. And he uses this image here, which both Second Clement and the pastor of Hermas use as early as the very beginning of the second century. Um, second Clement, well, 135, first Hermas, 140. Now it's put back to 120. So very early men were quoting this as an old work already. Um, then, um, quotation from Pearl of Great Price here, but... Uh, The glory of God is intelligence. He uses this here. That God has given to us the greatest of all blessings, the power of intelligence, of mercy and peace and spirit. But first of all comes intelligence. Then he says he has given you the sign of the right hand. You're going to get that all the time. He's is, is giving you the sign of the right hand. He says it is the sign. He says, Pima et It is the sign, the giving of the right hand. This pet, this very thing. And the importance of the family. Revelation, the importance of family life here. Again, we all return to God, and there's only one way we can return to God, that is by the Son. Now he says, what is his name? We cannot know God the Father except by the Son, he said. Therefore, the name is the Son. And tepeferem, perem, and pemiot. For the Son is the name of the Father. Piot, for the Son is the name of the Father. That is the name of the Son. Well, he says, why do we call him the Son, then, if he's the Father? Because only by the Son can we know him. But on the other hand, he says, the name is a mystery. It makes things clear to our eyes and ears that we wouldn't understand otherwise. The Father cannot be named and cannot be known without the Son. Sons have the name of their fathers. So when we use the name of the Son, he says, we go as far as we can. He says, now there's no existence without a name. We identify things by name. The Gospel of Philip has a lot to say about this name business. And the name we use, he keeps referring again and again, the Son is his name. Then he says, There is one name given to them all, and it is this name. This is the name by which the Father is known, which is the same name by which the Son is known, the Son and the Father being one. But remember the name by which you shall be known. And then he talks more about the importance of the name. What is this name? It is the authentic name. It is this name, in fact, by which we come to the Father, and it is the name of the Son. And only one person has this name. And then he talks about the topoi here, the place to place, the various degrees of glory and kingdoms. They talk about that. It's about their other worlds. Um, the place from which everyone has come is the place for which he yearns. He speaks of that place and of the region where he will be received, where he received his real nature. This, again, is quoted in the very early Clementine recognitions uh, where Peter says, that our true nature was before we came here, and we came here for the testing and so forth. He's returning, referring to this. But he says our pre-existent was in another place. It was there that we have our, it is there that we have our true nature, and it's to that we'll be returned later on. Meantime, we are here being tried, he says, and we shall advance by degrees to the presence of the Father. And finally, this is a very good Egyptian touch, we shall be received into his presence by an embrace. This was the embrace which was the the culminating uh, part of the coronation with, uh, in Egypt with the, the Chetip when the king would embrace his son as his son and heir. And it's the form he uses here. You see, the Coptic is the, uses the... Well, here he used the Greek word, yes, but most for the, uh, the embrace by which the father will recognize you as his son and take you into his presence. Then he is... Um, here's a good one here. He describes God. That uh, he knows all the places... He knew them before they existed, and he had no need to be instructed by them. The uh, word used here is moite. It's, it's a very interesting word. All the ways and all the places of space. And then we get to the kolob motif. Here's a description of heaven comes next. Because um, you go from one grandeur to another until you reach the, this one great immeasurable grandeur um, toward which all things in the universe tend around this one point which is the center of them all, and uh, toward which we all move with strugglings and groans and pains and with much effort. 
and it ends with a quotation of the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is typically the stuff it deals in. Now, this is one that, uh, after they got it out at great expense and in great splendor, I say it's sort of been pushed aside. Nobody knows what to make of it. See, with the keys of these things lost, they just sort of forget about it and let them go. But you can see the general tendency. If this was the only document, you'd say, well, let it go. But at the same time this was discovered, they discovered these other Gospels. I want to mention one here, though. This was the, uh, the Gospel of the Twelve Apostles. This was discovered way back in 1913 and uh, is one of the four oldest Christian documents known most of the time. I think it's still older than any of the others here. And here we have an interesting thing because this tells us not what Christ, just what Christ taught after the resurrection, what he taught during the 40 days, but what he did. And this is what we want to know, what he did during the 40 days. Well, it starts out by saying he came and he wished to give his glory to all, to impart it to all, through the apostles. So he calls the apostles together and gives them a blessing and he tells them that he wants this, the glory to pass to him. He's going to organize the church here and he wants this for this generation, for this dispensation, to partake in these great blessings and uh, to enter them. Uh, and he wants them to become, he says, one in his glory. He does this by three steps. He transmits it, his glory to them by three steps. He goes away, then he orders them to have a meal. He has them share a meal with him. He has them sit down in, the, in 12 companies, and he has the sacrament is distributed to them. And while the meal is going on, he goes apart three times. The first time he prays and his countenance shines. And then he returns to the apostles and he blesses them. The second time he goes and he comes back and the apostles' countenances shine like his. The third time he comes back, the glory is imparted to the whole multitude and there is a grand uh, Pentecost uh, celebrated by it. Meantime, however, he has blessed the children and uh, he has made the announcement that the Jews have never saw were never allowed to see these things during his earthly mission because of his unbelief. And uh, he discourses to them on work for the dead. He puts Peter in charge of this particular work. And uh, when Peter makes his confession, it's because he has had a special revelation here. Now, these things, you'll notice, are interesting because they so closely parallel what Third Nephi says the Lord did when he returned after the resurrection, when he came to this continent. He organized the group into 12. Remember, he, or, he ordered the apostles to prepare for him, to organize the people, to baptize them all because he was coming the next day. And they did. They brought them all, they, all night long. Remember, they were bringing the people in, getting everybody they could there. When they got them there, they instructed them. They put an apostle in charge of each group. Each one was instructed. They sat in 12 companies. When the Lord came, he, oh, incidentally, he blesses and multiplies the loaves and fishes here to feed them, exactly as he does in the Book of Mormon. This is part of it. And uh, he, uh, the special purpose of the meal is made very clear here that they may be one like me, that they may have a fullness of my glory, he says, that nothing will be withheld from you, as he does in Third Nephi 20 and 8. Uh, the same thing is practically word for word there. And then these three steps. The, uh, the first time, he says, the glory was on him. And then he went, remember, the Book of Mormon, he went aside three times. He went apart three times and prayed each time. And it was by three steps or degrees that the glory was imparted to everybody there. And the second time he went, um, the glory of his Father was upon him and upon the others. And the third time the glory was upon all of them. And then, it's like quoting 3 Nephi 28 and 1 here and 28 and 4 and 5. And... Uh, they marveled at these things, and they spoke in tongues. He called a little child, and he blessed the child, and then there's a speaking in tongues. Then he multiplies the, the loaves and the fishes, and he feeds the multitude in the 12 groups, which is consistent with the rites of the temple, where the showbread was divided among the 12 uh, tribes the very same way. See, this is an old Jewish rite. He's simply perpetuating the same way in the baptism. And then he goes and tells them about the raising of the dead and how Adam led the spirits of our fathers out from the underworld and Adam, when he hears his, his voice, heard the voice of the Lord speaking there, and uh, he says, Adam heard my voice, and he said, I hear the voice of my Lord and my God and my Creator. 
And Adam himself bore testimony, and he preached to the spirits below, and he brought them out with him, as many as he could. Here was the kerygma, and bringing Adam into the picture is a very common motif here. So, um, this, I say, is a remarkable document. It's one of the longer-known ones, but its, its age is one of the things. See, it's quoted in the very earliest things, in the Gospel of Peter, in the Gospel of the Hebrews. The earliest records quote this telling not only what Christ spoke when he came during the 40 days, but actually what he did. And what we find him doing is exactly what we find him doing in 3 Nephi. And getting these, this is what he means by teaching them the things of the kingdom. We can't go into it there because we want to talk about them. Well, here's one that's got the most publicity, and as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> seems to be the least interesting. And yet it has some, this is the gospel according to Thomas. It's been got out by uh, Harper's, and you can get it at our bookstore here. But here, these are logia of Jesus, 114 sayings attributed to Jesus. And notice how the first line are. It starts out by saying, these are the secret words which the living Jesus, resurrected, you see, spoke, and Didymus Judas Thomas wrote. And secret words. These are the teachings of the apostles after that. Now, it's an interesting thing of these 114, a lot of them aren't found in the Bible. Very few of them are in the Bible in the form in which they are here. But... Some of them are accepted as genuine by everybody. Scholars say, yes, Jesus really did say some of these things, even though they're not in the Bible. So here we have genuine words of the Lord taught during the 40 days. You see, this is the sort of thing he would be talking about. And the theme is life. But he talks about reticence and secrecy and working for it. Whoever finds the explanation of these words will not taste death. Let him who seeks not cease to seek until he finds and then keep seeking. You have to work again this idea of working up by degrees, you'll notice, um, till he finds, and when he finds, he'll be troubled, and when he's troubled, he'll marvel, and then he will reign over all. This is one that's quoted quite early and in quite a number of sources, so you can check it. It isn't the only place where it occurs. It's one of the logia, as the words of Jesus are called, one of the logia attributed to Jesus. The stakes are high here. It's a struggle. You're not going to like it. You see, you're going to have to... Always this negative element that seems to be in the teaching, the sort of thing that people wouldn't invent for themselves. He'll be troubled, and when he's troubled, he'll marvel, and then he'll reign over all. That's his ultimate reward. Then, this, when you know who you really are, this pre-existence, that the kingdom is within you, and it is within you when you know who you really are. It is within you and among you, he said. Who are you? You are the sons of the living Father. That's who you really are. We are literally sons of God, is what he's bringing out in his... And as Carl Smith points out, this is meant in the most literal way imaginable, <laughs> a way that uh, Christians today, he said, wouldn't even uh, dare to imagine to themselves. But the early Christians took this very literally. He says, if you really know who you are, that's the answer. And who are you, he says? You are the sons of the living Father. But if you don't know yourself, then you are in poverty and you are poverty. See, the first thing is to know who you really are the literal children of your Father in heaven, to know you about your pre-existence. He says, if you don't know that, you're in a miserable state. You have nothing. You're completely poor. You are the children. Then, um, this, uh, the apostles asked for instructions after the resurrection. You notice this. And his disciples asked him, and they said to him, do you want us to fast? Tell us how we should pray, how we should give alms. This shows, this is asking them how they were to go about things then. Then, uh, their post-resurrection episodes of election. These are various sayings of the Lord. Preoccupation with the, with the degrees of glory. Here he talks about the three degrees of glory. Then, the future of the church. His best description of the future there, when they ask him about the kingdom, is the lady, toward the end, uh, the lady with the jar of meal on her head, where she says, is a gloomy prediction, yes. The kingdom is like a woman who was carrying a jar full of meal. While she was walking on a distant road, this is like the Lord taking a far journey, you see, what happens? The handle of the jar broke. The meal streamed out behind her on the road, and she didn't know it. She had noticed no accident. After she came into her house, she put the jar down and found it empty. That's what the kingdom is like, see? You don't know. The, remember the wicked parish and no man notices it? The, Paul says it's like the slinging of the noose. It comes insidiously. It comes quietly. We're bewitched, he says. 
uh, the, the devil works this way, and it says, this is the way it is. You have your jar full of meal, the woman, and very often, as in the past of Hermas, the church is represented as a woman carrying or doing something. Here the church is carrying the meal on her head, and she gets the vessel home, she has the forms, there's nothing in it. When nobody noticed it, it was all lost. It all fell out. This is the sort of imagery, but it's full of this sort of gloom. The Thomas is, uh, is full of this sort of thing. Uh, here again, you notice, we know that thou wilt go away from us. Who is it that shall be great over us? Who will take charge of the church? And so forth, they ask them. And then, he tells, he gives Thomas a commission, an authority, and he gives him three secret words. It's an interesting thing. And he withdrew, and he spoke three words to him. Thomas in private. Now, when Thomas came to his companions, they asked him, what did Jesus say to thee? See, in the James here, we just read from, they came to James and say, well, what did, Je what did Jesus say to you when he was teaching you? He not only taught the apostles sitting with them among them, you see, he, uh, he had private conferences with them too. And they said, uh, well, what did Jesus say to you? And Thomas said to them, well, if I tell you one of the words which he said to me, you'd take up stones and throw at me. I'm not going to tell you. This is the sort of thing. You can see the emphasis on, on secrecy here, on holding it down. And here's more gloomy predictions for the future. The apostles say, tell us how our end will be. And this is the, the picture he gives. Have you then discovered the beginning that you inquire about the end? Blessed is he who shall stand at the beginning and shall know that the end he shall not taste death. Be ready for it. Blessed is he who was before he came into being. Here's your pre-existence motif again. Blessed is he who was before he came into being. If your disciples come to me and hear my words, these stones will minister to you. For if, and then he talks about the winter time here. And uh, some good ones. Then, then they're talking about marriage, but uh, Philip's the best for that. This idea is when the difference between the sexes disappears, then we'll have the perfect unity we need to have. This was it, that we shall not think of sex as sort of a game or a feud or a rivalry, as the war between the sexes, which is the normal order of things. He says that shall have to pass away in the eternal order. And when you make the male and female into a single one, so that the male will not be male and the female not male, uh, female not female, then you make the eyes take the place of an eye, the hand the place of an eye, the foot in the place of a foot, the image in the place of an image, eye to eye, hand to hand, foot to foot, he says, then you shall enter the kingdom of God, when you know what that is about. This is explained quite fully in some of the other documents that were, documents that were found with this one. And um, and here was the success of Jesus' message, mission too. He says, Jesus said, I took my stand in the midst of the world, and in the flesh I appeared to them. I found them all drunk. I found none among them athirst. He ha found no takers at all. My soul was afflicted for the sons of men because they are blind and their hearts do not see that empty they have come into the world and empty they seek to go out of the world again. They're content to go out. Wash is the word it uses here, to seek. If wash it, wash it means they want to go out of the world empty and not seek. That's not seek. Seek is shame and this is wash it. Uh, and, and they want to go out of the world again. And that's the world. He said, I didn't have a chance. I came in the flesh, and that was, that was the way I was received. Jesus said, where there are three gods, they are gods. Where there are two or one, I am with him. Well, now, what is meant by that? Uh, good enough says we can't even guess what that's supposed to be talking about. Then there's uh, blessing the children and so forth. The... Uh, a little child shall know the kingdom, and he shall become higher than John. And John is the highest of all. But the blessing of the children is quite a motif here. Remember 3rd Nephi, they bring that in. That blessing of the children is an important thing. It comes in here. The, uh, here's your progress. They say, what is the sign of your father in you? If they ask that, he says, well, no, he starts up and saying, if people say to you, who are you? To the apostles, he says, say, we are the literal sons of God. We are the elect of the living father. If they ask you, what is the sign of your father in you? Say to them, it is a time of progress and a time of rest. It says a movement of time of rest. Anapa says, but it means a time of progress and a time of rest. His disciples say to him, well, when will we give a chance to rest? When will we repose of the dead? They come out and he said to them, what you expect has come, but you don't know it. His disciples said to him, 24 prophets spoke of Israel, and they all spoke about thee. Book of Mormon again. 
And none of them spoke except about the Messiah. All the prophets spoke about that and nothing. He'll dismiss the living one. Well, <clears throat> he talks about the tares and the wheat and the light and the darkness. Jesus said, I tell my mysteries to those who are worthy of my mysteries. What my right hand will do, let not thy left hand know what it does. He's talking about this very thing, about guarding it. The, uh, the elect will recognize him. Now, he talks about the times and seasons too. Jesus said, Seek and you will find, but those things which you asked me in those days I didn't desire to tell you was before the resurrection. Now you want to know them. But here we have the same order as in the New Testament. Throw not the pearls to the swine, lest they make it blank blank. Jesus said, Whoever seeks will find, and whoever knocks will open. And next in the very same sentence, you see. Don't give the pearls to the swine, but give them to whoever seeks for them. Then... Uh, more talk about marriage. If you make two one, you shall become the sons of man. Then when you say to a mountain, be moved, it will be moved. But you must achieve that state first of all. Now this is commented on much more fully in, the, in a better form here, where it says, they said, when will the kingdom come? Jesus said, it will not come by expectation. They render it here. You will not say see here nor see there. It's translated, remember, the kingdom of heaven cometh not with observation in the New Testament. The word is parateresis that Luke uses, and that means it's not what you expect it to be. Parateresis, not what you expect it to be. Um, Prostecatai, diakartarain, is the idea of elnajos here. It is not what you expect it to be, and don't try to imagine what it will be like. The one I mentioned a number of times here was this quite lengthy one known as the Gospel of Philip. It was found in the same library with this that was discovered in, well, 1947, supposedly. This stuff started appearing, but it's just being published now, and only a small part of it has come out so far. He uh, talks about the two ways here, and he builds up. <clears throat> he says, The things in this world do not carry on into eternity. All worlds pass away. He says they're worlds without number, but they all pass away. And then he says an interesting thing. There's only one thing that doesn't pass away. Remember the Pearl of Great Price says worlds come into existence and another world passes away. And as one world comes, another passes away. Uh, sort of Hoyle's theory, isn't it? But uh, his background. But Philip says there's one thing that does not pass away. There's just one thing that keeps on going and doesn't have to go through cycles. That is progeny. He says that's the thing. So that's what we're after, he says. If you can achieve progeny, that is the one thing that will keep on going forever because all the other worlds are just to make up uh, a room for it. The sons, he says, quoting just as we have here, the sun, as it was in the, uh, this one discovered way back in 1903, this in 52, the testament called the testament of Jesus, of the Lord Jesus. Here he says the very same thing. The son receives the name of the father, and this name, he says, is secret. Everything in the world must be named, to have a name to be communicated, he says. But you mustn't mix up names with things, names with, with realities. There's a false priesthood that falsifies names. The false archons do that. The devil has a plan in which he uses words this way for the enslavement of the human race. He says, uh, here was an interesting passage about the name of Jesus, uh, Christ and Messiah, where he says here that... Uh, Christ is a different name in different languages. He's always Jesus. Jesus is his regular name. But he says when a Syrian speaks, he has to talk about Messiah, and the Greeks talks about Christ. It depends on the language you're using and exactly what you're referring to. So in the Book of Mormon, you get the translation Christ, which in the original text was probably Messiah. Undoubtedly was that. You'll find in the earlier part of the Book of Mormon, Nephi, for example, only uses Messiah. <laughs> then when they understand Christ as meaning just that, they use that very, they use that, that name. Um... Here again, our earthly inheritance is the blood, he says, and it's the blood which binds us to this earth. Well, this is this point here. Now, he says, there are many people in the church that don't believe on the resurrection of the flesh. I don't go along with them. He says, there are very many of them. If you can demonstrate that it's so, I'll give you a prize, he says. Give us your proof that there is no resurrection, he says, so that we can, we can give you a prize. Um, because, he says, it's necessary that everything, not only man, but everything rise in the flesh. Because everything in this world is physical. 
He says you might not like it in your uh, metaphysical thinking, but everything in this world physical is physical and we might as well face it. That's the nature of our life here. Now, no man knows his real history, but who has ears to hear, let him hear. We're here to be rewarding according to our worthiness and according to our ability to recognize these things. And here it is, he says, that the real nature of Christ was revealed uh, in the transfiguration. But different people saw him in different ways. Only when he was transfigured did they see him as he actually was. Paul says, we shall, for we shall be like him. We'll know what he is like when we are like him. And this, again, is a common doctrine. There's the ascension of Isaiah that talks about that there. And he says the apostles had to be transfigured too before they could understand the transfigured Christ. Again, the Book of Mormon. When he worked and worked on the subject, and the Lord prayed the Father, then he received the glory of the Father. Remember his countenance shone. Then he went over and the apostles received that, and then their countenances finally shone. Then they could see what he was like. This is what it's talking about here. And this way, he says, you achieve this super unity. Then you become identical, identical in this sort of unity, and this is what happens in the Book of Mormon too. Now he says, speaking of pre-existence, the other worlds have been going on forever. The perfect man does not die. He continues to beget for all time. He shall be added upon forever and ever. Another thing. You see. Twice in this, uh, in, this doctrine, in this document, it makes the annoying statement that uh, Mary Magdalene was Jesus' wife. She traveled around with him, and they went together. And uh, she was, as it were, his other self. Then um, he talks about the idea of progress through inheritance here. Adam was both form, formed and begotten. He was begotten as the Son of God before he was formed to come down to this earth. You are identical. This is the doctrine. It's quite common to these things. You are identical with the thing you comprehend. Therefore, God comprehends all things. He is in all things, through all things, and about all things. And we wish to be identical with the things we comprehend too. And this doctrine of identity is worked on quite hard here. It's, it's an old Egyptian concept here. The, uh, here's the hymn to charity. He talks about progress and false progress. He, don't, uh, he says, don't think that busy work is going to get you anywhere, and he uses the example of the donkey who is working at the mill, grinding the wheat all day long. He says, and he walked 44 miles that day and ended up exactly where he started in the morning. He says, that's the kind of progress to avoid. It's going around in circles that way. Um, again, he saw, says, the sign is the stretching out of the hand. Perrette's Porsche is the used. He says, it's the sign of the cross, it's the sign of the nail, and it's received in the hand. The, uh, then he talks about Mary again here. He mentions the winter time of the just. When that time comes, the winter time of the just, it'll be like winter, there'll be good and bad people, but you can't tell the difference. See, in the winter time, you can't tell which trees are alive and which are dead. Yeah, they look all alike, at least at a distance. And that's the way it will be in the world soon, in what they call the winter time of the just. There'll be righteous people there, but they won't have a chance to bear fruit. They won't have a chance to blossom or anything else. Um, then this phrase again, blessed is he who is before he came into being. The same thing in the Gospel of Thomas, you see. Before Abraham was, I am. The real greatness of man is a secret. His true destiny but by this secret, he rules all the creatures of the earth. Adam learned the nature of this universe and of the creatures therein by speaking to the Lord through a veil. This is mentioned specifically here. That the secret of power, he says, the secret of the word to use is the administration, the economy of a physical world is learned through a veil. The mere name of Christ is empty. It won't help you at all unless you have the gift of the Holy Ghost, he says. Then he starts working on his main theme, which is the importance of marriage. And he, he builds it up and he builds it up. He says an evil spirit has entered into this sex business. And the escape from that sort of thing, the escape from a licentious life, is through marriage. A closely tied couple is proof against the promiscuous vices of the world, he says. And they must in time learn to think in the in the terms of, of complete identity. He says, this is world is a place of evil because it's a place of testing. This world is the kingdom of death. He uses that expression here. Don't think too much about the flesh, he says, but don't too, think too little about it either. Don't contemn it, say, like the philosophers, and say, well, forget it and try to get loose from it and regard it as a curse. No. On the other hand, don't become preoccupied with it and make it your main interest to things. That will be just as damaging. 
Don't fear it, he says, and don't love it. Uh, else it will consume you. No, this is the world of the two ways, and you're here to be tested. He puts it very clearly on the line. Now, he says, all things in this world are in types and images. Uh, they're the forms through which the world... He's always talking about aconis here, types and typoi, types and images, and he borrows the Greek words for it here. And we never see things as they actually are. He says, he uses the word, the naked reality. We can't see it because things come to us through types and images. These are necessary to convey all instruction to us. And he says, that's why we have the temple, to convey instruction through types and images. And don't think it's valid, not valid, just because they're types and images. On the other hand, don't get the idea that these types and images are the final thing, that this is what it is. They're only types, but they're types of very solid instruction. I'll really tell you about things. This uh, is the teaching of the elders. Now, for example, um, he says, makes this expression, this is literally translated here, you put it down here. If you receive the anointment and the sign in your right hand and your left hand, you will become not just a Christian, but a Christ. The Lord makes an ordinance for everything in this world. There is a baptism, there is anointing, there is a sacrament of salvation, but the highest ordinance of all is marriage. He says, there are these five steps beginning with baptism. And upon achieving them all, then you become, he says, you achieve the highest degree of all. He says there are five steps here, he puts it. Those are five ordinances. And he says there's great, it's very important to keep these things secret and not divulge them to the world. And then he talks about the work for the dead, the perfect unity of the sexes. There is no death in that, he says. The man, quotes Paul, man is not without the woman and the Lord. And he says, when Adam and Eve sinned and fell, they were separated. They became sort of hostile to each other. There was a tension and strain between them. But when they were united together in eternal marriage, he says, then, he says, they brought things back to their proper state. He says, there are high qualifications for the bridal chamber. He says, uh, great strength, great self-control, pure and upright Living before marriage, he says, is extremely important. He mentions that, he says, the temple has three parts. There are three parts to the temple. Baptism is holy, but the holy of holies is marriage. Baptism is a form of resurrection, he says, but marriage is higher than all the other forms. Baptism is resurrection, but marriage is exaltation. He's hitting that. You can see why this was not uh, preserved in the church. Then he makes this remarkable statement on plate 118 here. He says, Christ Christ came specifically to unite the male and the female in what he says will be an eternal marriage when the two become one. And he says, then they shall have progeny forever and ever. And the purpose of Christ's mission, he says, was to unite the male and the the female here. The steps of salvation, he says, are to be begotten, to be anointed, to be redeemed, to be saved. Um, Adam, upon eating of the fruit, he says, became an animal. This is Joseph Fielding Smith's uh, thesis. You know, there was some physical change undergone here. Adam ate something, something happens here, and Adam became a different type of being from what he was before. He wasn't exalted being anymore and went through these tests. So don't forget, we are animals. And um, he says, in this world... The order of master and servant is reversed usually uh, because the devil wants to rob men of their liberty and you can expect only trial and tribulation but be able to take things in their stride, he says. The, the only time you see things in their true forms, he says, is in the temple. But this is our great chance. If you do not receive these ordinances, he says, in this earth you will never receive them at all. Now he says here, this thing is for eternity. And he says, uh, toward the end here, when he gets really worked up, he says the end is uh, for eternal marriage, and these marriages will happen in turn. But he keeps emphasizing the fact that the ordinances must be performed in this life or they cannot be enjoyed at all. He says literally here, if you don't receive it on this earth, you will not receive it at all. He says for the anointing we must use olive oil because that's a tree of life. It's a symbol of resurrection, he said. The life, uh, the oil of the anointing, for the resurrection comes from it. And um, he talks about trees again. Anointing comes after baptism, he says, and is a higher ordinance. And everyone must be anointed. 
It is part of baptism, but it is better than baptism. And he quotes Clements here on the anointing of Adam, how he received it. But he says, now, here's Satan's plan and transgression laid at the beginning of the world. He says the sacrament and the anointing are not the highest ordinances. And then he starts talking about the pre-existence and the test here. The combat in the world, the fight in the council in heaven, play, uh, Satan's plan and the transgression of the human race at the beginning of the world. And he says there's one way we can overcome this, and that's what I'm talking about when I talk about higher ordinances. He says the Son is the key to everything. And here's this passage, 123, where he says, Children go on forever. Things do not. Worlds come into existence and pass away. Only progeny continues in a straight line. Now, Satan wanted things to go on forever and ever. This is an interesting theory he wants. He wanted, didn't want worlds to be destroyed. He wanted people to be pure at the beginning and just carry on forever and ever. He wanted worlds to be indestructible, rule out this element of testing. That was his plan, as it's given here. It's a, it's a new twist and rather interesting one. That Satan wanted things to go on forever and ever, but things don't. Let's face it. The physical world breaks down and goes through cycles, and we all do. It's all finished. Um, then he says an interesting thing here. You're not just receiving when you receive these rites and ordinances. You are preparing to give. You must be able to receive before you can give. Our object is not to receive these blessings alone, but to be able sometime to bestow them. Of course, this is God that he's talking about. Because he goes on and says, you must become a son before you can become a father. In in our sacrament, we use water or wine in the cup, he says, talking about this. The objective, however, he says, I don't know how that line got in. No, that's the line after. Uh, is to be active rather than passive. Not merely to receive these things, but to bestow them. You must be able to receive before you give. You must be a, a son before you be a father. Why do you want to be a son, though? Why do you want to receive? So that someday you will be able to bestow these things yourself. Amazing view of things. Then he talks about the garment you receive at baptism. And he says, like begets like. And here's an interesting equation, he says. If like begets like, and we call God our father, what are we? See? Like begets like. He goes in the line. He says here, uh, like begets like, an animal begets an animal. Uh... A man begets a man, and a God begets what? See? We say God is our Father. If light begets light, what are we? Well, um, there is no marriage in heaven, he says. It must be here. In the eternities, it has a different form. He says our marriage will carry on in the eternities, but it will have a different form there. It must be contracted here. If not here, it won't be possible at all. He talks about the two ways again. Then he says... Is not fitting at this time to know everything about ourselves. Man's nature is really secret when you come down for it. And uh, he shouldn't know too much right now. There are other places. If you have not mastered the places in this world, you will not be able to master the places in the next world. If you, hadn't performed, if you don't understand these forms and ordinances here, you see, the idea is don't postpone them. They must be done here because you won't understand what's going on there unless you master the forms here. Then he talks on being perfect in this world. We go down into the water, but not into death. The, uh, well, light cleaveth unto life. So that's a very good passage about the Good Samaritan, and then he ends up, um, we must not mourn for the dead. He says we should do their work for them and, and rejoice in it. Instructions in discipleship. He says there's another step beyond begetting, and that is creating. Dude, that's another thing to be understood. Begetting is one thing, but then creating is another step yet. Uh, he, he says, undefiled marriage is the great mystery. The penalty for revealing this is death, he says, and then he describes the forms by which life can be taken here, and uh, says the gospel is taught through types and ordinances. I'm winding up here, he says. But it has to do with real powers that control the real universe. And here's where he makes this statement on 132. He says... It is behind the veil that we learn the secrets of the creation, the forms by which the creatures run. And then there's a, a real passage here. What the rending of the veil meant, he says, at the time of Christ was not the abolition of the temple, but revealing what is behind it from the top to the bottom, that we might enter into its truth. We enter into it through symbols which are despised by the world. And when we go there, they regard us as weakness, uh, weakness and foolishness. We enter these things, he says, through symbols despised by the world. Today, 
We are too weak to understand everything, but the time is coming when the temple will become universal and all will receive the anointings and when all will be united in marriage. And then the conclusion here, which will be the marriage in the light. If one becomes a son of the bridal chamber, he will receive the light. If you do not receive it in this place, you cannot receive it in any other. The types of the temple prepare us for the next world. It's a form of instruction, he says. Then he says, these things are an earnest of things to come. In them the two worlds meet and join. This is the end of the Gospel of Philip. Well, you'll admit that's a remarkable document. It's typical of these things that come out here, the things that were going on. It uh, rings bells with us, but it is also disturbing the, the whole Christian world is being very much upset now. And I say, there is much more of this behind what's going on, say, in Rome now in the Ecumenical Council than we imagine. I see there is no time for questions, which is a good thing. <laughs> well, I don't know how we could handle them. But here there's an indication, isn't it amazing? What if Christ really did come for 40 days after all? Off and on, it doesn't say that he played exactly 40 days, that he was here all the time. See, it's, it uses the word dim, and he stayed, he was here from time to time. He revealed himself from time to time and taught these things. Well, did he really? Do these things have any background of truth at all? Well, the one thing that's recognized today, true or not, whether you believe them or not, this is what the early Christian church taught. They didn't get it from the New Testament, did they? They say they got it from that 40 days teaching of the Lord. So what do you think about it? Well, we can bear our testimonies and sit down then. We know the gospel is true, not from this, of course. This talks a lot about testimony too, but through the manifestation of the Spirit, which is the only way we can know these things. I mean, you could answer all these things, I suppose, Walter. Without any trouble at all. I think we're going to have a, was a closing prayer. Do you want to put a...